the study and, and practice of employment relations, of the employment relationship, is controversial in a way that other aspects of management are often not controversial. Um, it doesn't rest quite so much in the kind of technicalities of how to do something. There is a lot more emphasis on values, on interests, on competing ideas about uh, what is right, what is valid, what is legitimate for different parties to the employment relationship to try and seek, to try and advance uh, in various ways. And we see this in the way that employment relations issues are reported in the media, in the way in which they enter into the political discourse. They're controversial. They excite opinions on one side or another. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just unpacking that, thinking about why it is that this area of organisational life, this understanding and practice of the way in which employers and employees relate to each other should be controversial, unusually so, um, and how we can understand uh, the nature of that controversy and how we can make sense of the different competing ideas that different people have about how the employment relationship should work. So we're going to try and unpack it and think about the theory or the theories of uh, employment uh, relations. Now, one of the key reasons why this area of organisational life is controversial is because there are simply competing interests at stake here. We're often dealing with issues which are a zero-sum game. For one side of the employment relationship uh, to advance their interests, the other side of the employment relationship will often have to give up something or lose something. For one side to win, the other side has to lose uh, a little bit. Uh, and so, naturally, the sense of what is right, about what is legitimate, about what actors in the employment relationship should be trying to achieve at any particular point in time, will be bound up with and will reflect our ideas about what is legitimate for one side or the other to pursue and what the cost of pursuing those interests might be for others that are involved in the employment relationship and others that are affected by those issues in the employment relationship. So this sense of legitimacy, this idea about what is right to do uh, for one actor or the other in the employment relationship, it must rest in something. It's not just something that just pops into our head out of thin air. These ideas, these, uh, these critiques that we make about how people behave in the employment relationship surely rests in something. It rests in the values that we hold about uh, the principles, the things that ought to be, the way that the relationship should play out, about some idealised version of what we think employment relations should be about, about how it should function, about the various rights and responsibilities that the parties to the employment relationship uh, should carry. It also rests in the assumptions that we hold, uh, our implicit beliefs about human behaviour, about why people do things, about how people respond to various situations, various scenarios, various stimuli. This idea that uh, we, these ideas that we hold about the, the, the nature of things, the nature of people, uh, the nature of their behaviour, and the nature of the institutions in which people uh, act. Now these ideas are expressed uh, in a little model uh, for, that, um, that Bud and Barve uh, put together, which neatly encapsulates these influences, the things that, um, that provide the underpinning of our implicit theory of the employment relationship, which we may not be aware that we even have, but which can be incredibly useful to surface, to make uh, tangible, to understand why we think certain things about uh, the employment relationship. Because then that allows us to take a little bit of distance on controversial issues. 
It allows us to think, why do we take that approach? And it also allows us to understand, in an area of controversy, why do other people disagree with us? Because once we can understand where people's disagreements come from, then we can make sense of them, and we can respond to them in a rational rather than an uh, emotional uh, way. Which is not to say that emotion is a bad thing, but it allows us to engage in a more measured way once we understand the things that underpin other people's opposing ideas around this uh, implicitly controversial area. So these values, these assumptions, these rest behind our implicit uh, theory of the employment relationship. And those values, the, 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 the principles that we, um, uh, we, that, we ha that we hold about what ought to be, about how the employment relationship ought to function, about how it, how it should ideally be, um, are often bound up with and reflect uh, what we think about the interests of the various parties to the employment relationship. So what is it that we think that employees should get out of the employment relationship? What should work mean? What should employers' role in the employment relationship be? What responsibilities do they hold? How should society seek to manage or constrain the employment relationship? Does it have any role like that at all? Or should employers and employees simply be left alone to, uh, to get on with it? And we all hold these assumptions implicitly if we take a moment uh, to think about it. How do we, how do we respond uh, to these issues? Uh, and when we unpack some of those assumptions, then we can start to put together some of the constellations of opinions that we hold, uh, and they can often form coherent theories of the employment relationship. So, for example, if we start to think about the opinions that we might hold, the assumptions that we have about what it is that the employment relationship should mean for employees, and I keep using this word should, because these are ideas about what we think is right. Not what are they, but what do we think is right? How, what should the employment relationship do? How should it function in respect to the key parties that are involved? So if we turn to employees first. Employees, as we've discussed, enter into agreements with employers to sell their labour uh, in return for uh, rewards. Now, for some people, some people may assume that that is the end of the story, that it is a simple uh, transaction, that work and what employees do in the work relationship is simply about survival uh, and income. And we can, we can think about this in, in, in more concrete terms. If we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we think about those bottom levels uh, of uh, that well-known uh, pyramid. That desire for survival and income, uh, that may be all that employees want out of the employment relationship, or certainly we may assume that that is all that employees uh, want. Uh, we know that um, uh, conflict can often uh, result uh, when people's most basic uh, needs, uh, when their inability to uh, to successfully uh, acquire necessary resources. When they can't do that, that's often when people are pushed into conflict uh, situations. So at some level, the very bottom of the employment relationship, uh, there is that fundamental need to simply survive, that it is a source of income, it's a way in which people maintain their, their life in one way or another. And for many people, that may be as far as we need to go in terms of understanding what the employment relationship should mean for employees. Other people may have different assumptions. Other people think that um, employment means something much more than that, or it should mean much more than that for employees. So it may not be simply a question of providing an income, a source of survival, but also to represent um, some measure of fairness uh, that uh, we don't just go to work and if we get sufficient for what we need, 
then that's enough. That, that's enough to satisfy us, to make us happy. If we think again about a different motivation theory, we think about ad the work of, uh, of Adams and equity theory, we know that unfairness around rewards for work, unfairness in that effort-reward uh, bargain, uh, is a key source of dissatisfaction, a key mechanism by which people balance the amount of effort that they're prepared uh, to put in. We know that uh, many important institutions regard human dignity through work as a crucial employee interest. The International Labour Organization, the Catholic Church and others see human dignity through work as being a very important and fundamental goal that people should attempt uh, to achieve. We may think that it's not just about turning up at work and doing our job, um, but actually that our humanity uh, as people in an employment relationship, not just as factors of production, is also expressed through our ability to have a say, to have a voice uh, at work, to have an input into decisions, that people should be able to influence what goes on in their work environment, that they can uh, understand and, um, uh, and affect the way in which decisions are made, uh, both decisions that affect them directly and wider decisions that affect uh, their workplace. And that, that isn't just something that they might like, but it's something that's, that's fundamental to how the employment relationship should function for employees. Still others might see um, work as a, an important source of the achievement of human identity. So the way in which people become fulfilled as human beings, so again, not just as workers, not just as wage earners, but as human beings, um, that work provides that important function. And again, if we turn to ideas about intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, rewards, if we start to track Maslow's hierarchy of needs a little bit further up uh, the pyramid, we can start to think about how work can have a much deeper meaning uh, for employees. For Marx, the human being, the, hu the nature of what it was to be human was about the expression of creativity through work and that one of the great tragedies of uh, capitalist forms uh, of production was when people are alienated from the products of their labour, that their, their, their human nature was somehow lessened uh, by not having full control over uh, the fruits uh, of their labour. Uh, many world religions see work as a religious duty, uh, the, the Protestant work ethic, you know, the Calvinist ideas, uh, which is also reflected in Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. All of these things ascribe much deeper meanings of work for people than simply about turning up. If we take a more radical view, um, drawing again on the, the works of, uh, of people like uh, Marx, uh, they see the whole nature of what it is to be an employee in work as being bound up with systems of power uh, and control, and particularly in the employee's absence of power and control. And that this power relationship between employers and employees is a fundamental uh, part of understanding the employee's role within the employment relationship. And so for those people, understanding and trying to change that power dynamic is a central feature of what the employment relationship should be about. Understanding the nature of employment relations is only partial, is incomplete without recognising the power dynamics and the power differentials between employers and employees. If we turn to the role of employers in uh, the employment relationship, we see similar issues uh, playing out. So for some people, the role of the employer in the employment relationship is very simple. It's about profit maximisation, uh, that an employer's duty uh, is primarily to the shareholders, the owners of the, uh, the organisation, uh, and that 
um, the interest, the legitimate interests of employers within the employment relationship is all bound up uh, with that. Employers, owners bear the risks of the enterprise, and so therefore uh, they should carry the bulk of the benefits uh, of the enterprise as well. And so they're seen as the key actor in the employment relationship, that it privileges them in certain ways because of the amount of risk uh, that, we, that they carry. Other people see uh, an employer's responsibilities rather differently within the employment relationship. So they, uh, they would be critical of the assumptions that shareholders carry all of the risk in the organisation, so therefore they're privileged in some way. For those people, people who ascribe to ideas like uh, the stakeholder theory, um, the risks uh, implied within uh, an organisation are much more broadly spread. Risks to employees who, if an organisation fails, don't just pick up another job because labour markets are not perfect. They don't, you know, a, a, a competitor does not rise from the, the ashes of the failure of one organisation. They carry the risks of unemployment and poverty and so on. Uh, a community carries the risks of an organisation uh, either taking jobs from or bringing jobs to uh, uh, it, its locality. Uh, a society carries the, the risks of an organisation uh, despoiling the environment. So there are all kinds of risks that are associated uh, within and around an organisation. And because that risk is more broadly spread, people who, um, who, who take this approach would argue that therefore the responsibilities of an employer in the employment relationship is more broad than simply to satisfy the interests of the shareholders. That the shareholders should not be particularly privileged, but that the, the role and responsibilities of an employer in the employment relationship is to look after all of these disparate uh, interests indicates a, 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 a certainly a more paternalistic view of what employers should do uh, in the employment relationship, um, but also a more diverse set of roles and strategic objectives that would be implied uh, for employers to, uh, to, to seek to achieve uh, within uh, the employment uh, relationship. Um, if we look again at more radical ideas, um, critique of the employer's role in the employment relationship focuses on these issues of power and control again. The, the proper understanding of employment relations is all about understanding the, uh, the power dynamics. That uh, it isn't simply a technical process of understanding that uh, some people might see that uh, employer interests or owner interests should be privileged as against a broader stakeholder idea. It's all about a more deliberate strategy to um, look after the, and advance the power and wealth interests of a particular uh, group. That it's about the nature of capitalism uh, and so that the relationship between employer and employees reinforces class relations, class power differentials. Or sometimes it may be that uh, a, a radical critique of uh, the employer role in employment relations takes a more feminist point of view different elite groups, that it's about protecting the interests of uh, predominantly male uh, uh, owners uh, within the employment relationship, and their interests are deliberately uh, privileged. Uh, and so we see the, the, this radical critique, uh, which draws rather broader uh, uh, conclusions about the role of employers in the employment relationship, that it's bound up in much bigger uh, political uh, and class, often class-based uh, interests uh, right the way across uh, society uh, and economy. The final uh, actor that we often talk about in the employment relationship is, is the state. And here we're talking about the state rather broadly uh, drawn. Now, the state has um, variously taken a, a more or less active role in the employment uh, relationship. It may take on a whole range of roles, from regulatory, setting the, the laws within which the employment relationship functions, as an employer directly, 
in the provision of public sector employment, um, a more um, kind of facilitative role, providing the basis within which, you know, of, of norms and values within which the employment relationship happens, how the society's broad expectations for what it means to be a good uh, employer, um, the, the, providing the policy framework for how the economy functions, the rules and frameworks within which, not just legal rules and frameworks, but the, the basis of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the society and the economy within which the employment relationship happens. So there's a wide range of functions within which the state has a major influence uh, on the employment relationship and how the state sees its role in relation to all of the potential uh, avenues uh, of influence will depend upon the, the, the kind of assumptions that we hold about uh, what we think the state ought to do. And so this is reflective of political discourse. Parties of the right tend to want to rein back on uh, that kind of um, influence and the, the role of the state in the employment relationship. Parties of the left rather more so uh, want to see the, the state rather more engaged in the employment uh, relationship. So we, you know, so we see this, this these swings uh, that some people will assume that the state should simply be about um, providing the, the conditions within which the employment relationship can happen. To broadly provide a kind of liberal framework, a freedom uh, for people to engage with each other, to establish that relationship, to make sure that the laws as as, such as there, there are, are upheld, but really then to keep it at that, to provide liberty of contract, protection against property damage, uh, protection of pro uh, property rights, but that's about it, a fairly minimal view of the role of the state. Other people would be rather more activist and think that the role of the state as the representative of society should be to pr uh, promote certain values. That if we want to see uh, a society where there is more, not less uh, equality, uh, then the state needs to intervene more actively in order to uh, protect more vulnerable groups. So. Um, equality legislation or protection uh, against um, low pay through minimum wage or living wage uh, legislation. Uh, various interventions to reduce market imperfections. That we don't just stand back and say, well, that's how the market works and so therefore that's fine, that's up to those people involved in that relationship directly, but to actually intervene uh, more actively to try to balance bargaining power between uh, workers uh, and employees, to provide mechanisms which ensure employees have greater voice, to pick up on some of those issues that we've talked about in relation to the other actors and to enforce them in one way or another. A radical critique uh, of the role of the state in uh, employment relations uh, sees the state as being bound up in all of these power uh, relations, that the state simply acts to uh, support the powerful, that they act as uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the ruling class uh, writ large, that they are there to, uh, to support and reinforce the status quo which privileges uh, the, uh, the powerful, the employers, uh, and uh, to, um, to fail uh, to act in support of, um, uh, of employees. Uh, and we, and they, they point to examples of uh, the government tends to be relatively uh, uh, one-sided uh, in terms of their dealing with uh, employment relations issues, that they will tend to condemn strike action, uh, but not uh, condemn, uh, say, uh, employer lockouts, uh, that they, their, their, their actions betray uh, their real sympathy, uh, and that is because the state simply represents those entrenched class interests uh, and that that will always be so until some more radical change uh, occurs in society more broadly.